Hi, everyone. It's so good to see you. I think uh, we expect about uh, 170 attendees today. And uh, so it's my real pleasure today to welcome you to this uh, Tuesday lunch with Rita dedicated to granuloma. Everything you want to know about granuloma, uh, I think you will have the answer in the next uh, few minutes. And uh, we have three uh, speakers today. We'll learn about uh, immunodeficiencies and uh, granuloma. We will learn about blow disease. And then we will have the patient's voice uh, at the end to conclude the session. So we are very lucky to have this uh, combination of speakers. I just remind you that you can ask any question during the, the talk using the, the q and air and uh, at the end, we will resume the, to the, the talk and uh, ask the question. We will have probably around 10 minutes to ask the, the burning question at the end. And uh, I will start to uh, introduce Benjamin Fournier, who is uh, MD, PhD, and pediatric immunologist, rheumatologist at the uh, Necker Hospital. He is uh, a specialist of EBV susceptibility, immunodeficiency uh, with a great interest in granuloma, and it will start with an overview of immunodeficiencies associated to granuloma. So Benjamin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Alexandre, for the introduction. Um, I think I should switch. Do you see, do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Pointer. Okay, so uh, I will try, uh, I will just remove that from my screen, sorry. Okay, good. So uh, I will try to, um, to, to use several uh, clinical cases to uh, illustrate to you um, the relationship between uh, pediatric systemic granulomatous disorders and primary immune deficiency and why it's important to uh, to recognize and to make diagnosis of uh, these disease when you are facing uh, a child with pediatric systemic granulomatous disorders. So first to start, I think it's important to consider what uh, sh should be viewed as a classic pediatric onset sarcoidosis to find the differences when you, you are suspecting primary immune deficiency. So here are the main features of what we can call pediatric onset sarcoidosis. The median age starts around 11 years old. It's mainly a sporadic disease, and there are some organs with a so-called classic presentation affecting the lung, the lymph nodes, the skin, the eye with vitis. In children, there is often a systemic feature, but as you know, it can affect many other organs. Importantly, the level of IgG is normal or increased, and there are some classic radiological findings, uh, especially on uh, CT, uh, uh, thorax uh, CT or uh, uh, chest X-ray and mainly the lymphatic topography. And uh, if you can perform a biopsy, there, are, there is also some classic histopathology. The granuloma are non-necrotizing, they are coalescent and they are quite well formed. And commonly you can find fibrosis around granulomas. So if you are um, taking care of a child with uh, different with, uh, systemic granulomatous disorders, you can find uh, other features that may, consider, may be considered as red flags. And uh, here is, is uh, when you should consider primary immune deficiency. Obviously, when the disease onset starts at a young age, if there are familiar cases or if there is an atypical family history, if there uh, are unusual, unusual organ involvements, importantly, if you have other associated diseases such as recurrent infections, autoimmunity, autoimmune cytopenia, lymphoma, cancer. Uh, if uh, the IgD or the IgM levels is low, it's also quite uncommon for classic uh, sarcoidosis. And uh, you should re review your case with a, a well-skilled uh, um, radiologist and a pathologist because there are also uh, atypical findings in, in uh, in both these fields that should you, uh, make you consider a primary immune deficiency. So I will start with the prototypic granulomatous disease in primary immune deficiency, which is called uh, CGD for chronic granulomatous disease. 
Uh, it's a uh, like all primary immune deficiency, it's a genetic disease that may be X-linked, so it affects boys or autosomic recessive disease. And as you can see, it's uh, um, it uh, the mutation will impair the, the function of this protein complex, which is very important to uh, produce ROS. And as you may know, ROS is extremely important for neutrophils and macrophages to perform uh, full uh, full phagocytosis and to destroy fungi and bacteria. So these patients are very susceptible to some bacteria to fungi and also to mycobacteria and here this is a, this will form uh, an infectious granuloma around these microorganisms that can be removed from the body so if you have a suspicion it's quite easy to to go to to uh, to go to the diagnosis you can uh, quite easily uh, measure rust production with flow cytometry with thr and then the genetic testing will give you the definitive diagnosis but interestingly, you can see here on the last part of the slide that ROS is also important to uh, decrease to damper inflammation through decreasing uh, interleukin beta and decreasing TNF alpha production. And these patients, they can also present with non infectious granuloma. They may present with digestive tract. They, these may be the onset of the disease with uh, inflammatory bowel disease. They may present with obstruct obstructive cystitis, with lung disease, with eye disease due to non-infectious granuloma. And this is important because granuloma are uh, often a problem in this patient, even if they are non-infectious, and they respond to immunomodulation that we can use corticosteroids or uh, TNF inhibitor. But as you will understand, uh, this is a very high risk to use TNF inhibitor if this patient has also an atypical mycobacteria. So, it's very important to keep that in mind in primary immune deficiency with susceptibility to infection. You should uh, make your best to exclude an infection. You should repeat biopsy. You should perform advanced microbiological tests. And for instance, in CGD, uh, bronchoalveolar lavage has not a good yield, and you, you should perform biopsy to exclude a, 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 an infection. So I will continue with a uh, uh, clinical picture here. We are with a, a four years old girl born from non consanguineous parents. She starts here, as you can see, with a vertebral osteitis. You can see the defect here on the CT. The CRP uh, was normal and she had only intermittent fever. There was uh, no effect from antibiotics. At six years old, she developed type, um, skin uh, nodule, multinodular splenomegaly, and the tuberculi tuberculin test was positive and she received anti tuberculosis treatment which has no, uh, not so much effect. So she, uh, she uh, had uh, many biopsy on the bone, it was non-contributory for the osteology. On the spleen, we found gigantocellular epithelial granuloma that was called as sarcoidosis-like around some vessels, and it was um, termed annular granuloma on the skin. So the obvious question here is, is there any mycobacteria? There was not found on uh, the bone for PCR on future, not on the spleen only on PCR, and not uh, on the skin either on PCR or culture. So uh, the girl had genetic testing, and in fact, we found a primary immune deficiency with an innate immune defect, which is dominant gamma interferon receptor 1 deficiency, which lead to uh, Mondelian susceptibility to mycobacteria. If we continue, uh, at eight years old, she had foot skin nodules and one pulmonary nodules, and then she had again splenomegaly and radiographic bone and pulmonary, pulmonary lesion. Again, what is the question? Is there any mycobacteria here? And this time we found on spleen and skin culture mycobacterium avium. So probably from the beginning, this patient had a atypical mycobacteria infection. And so I think it's something to keep in mind when you are in front of a primary immune deficiency, you should uh, keep in mind that it may be um, difficult to find a uh, microorganism and conversely when you have a patient with systemic granul uh, granulomatous disorder and if you find an atypical microorganism you should think of a primary immune deficiency. So new clinical case, uh, here you have a two-year-old boy uh, who is born from a non-consanguineous non parent he developed nodular elbow skin lesion, adenitis. So you see that here the red flag of a very young age. And uh, on histology, there were granuloma, but no microorganism. 
A new red flag is that it developed bronchiectasis and it received IVIG. And you can see here that it also developed uh, hepatomegaly and splenomegaly. Uh, adenopathy is here in the mediastinum, and here you can see the, the skin lesion. On biopsy, the patient has granulomatous hepatitis, and the spleen bears numerous giant epithelial granulomas. And, and importantly, we found on this biopsy, the, uh, we found some rubella from the vaccine of strain, with, which is also strongly indicative of a primary, an, an underlying primary immune deficiency. It developed then nodular and curved skin lesion, and again, uh, this time necrotic granuloma, and we found again the rubella vaccine of strain. And in fact, this patient had from the beginning global lymphopenia, and he was bearing uh, two mutations in RAG1. So this patient uh, has in fact combined immune deficiency, and it's very important because the treatment of this genetic disease is a uh, allogeneic uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, uh, which is a very, which is curative, but which is a very difficult to lead treatment. And after HSCT, the patient developed numerous complications and uh, he eventually died from a fatal liver disease. And uh, uh, this is quite important to, uh, to highlight uh, because HSCT is difficult to lead, but the um, the prognosis of HSCT is strongly correlated to the good health condition of your patient as, uh, at HSCT. And if you want that your patient comes with a good general condition at HSCT, uh, you should uh, have performed the diagnosis early. So all the period before HSCT is extremely important so that uh, your patient is in a good condition and making the diagnosis early will help, will help to, uh, so we help the the prognosis of uh, HACT in this disease. And so for this hypomorphic RAG1 and RAG2 mutation, so uh, first importantly, you should know that uh, when the mutation are severe, it is a cause of severe combined immune deficiency. When the mutation is more hypomorphic, it is one cause of many combined immune deficiency. We say combined because the T cell defect will lead to a B cell defect. So it can, it can lead to granuloma but, uh, on the skin, but also on the mucosa that can be uh, quite debilitating, also on the deep organs. The median age is quite early, around four years old. It may be associated to autoimmunity and recurrent infection, but uh, not consistently. Also non-consistently, there may be lymphopenia or hypoEGG, but uh, what is uh, always present is a strongly decreased naive T cell, so it should be performed uh, to lead to the diagnosis. Uh, these granulomatous lesions, there is no very effective treatment, and this patient sh uh, should always consider allohSCT. So here, are new clinical case, a two years old girl born from non consanguineous parents. She was in quite general, good general condition, no failure to strive, and she developed these relapsing, remitting nodular skin and, uh, lesions on the face and arms. Uh, no macro macroorganism found, no effect of any of this treatment. And she had repeated biopsy and we found epithelial and necrotizing granulomas in the deep dermis. And again, uh, we found rubella vaccine of strain, which is strongly indicative of primary immune deficiency. And this time, the genetic test, uh, we uh, found perforant deficiency. Uh, which is a cause of familial HLH, uh, which, cause, which can cause very fulminant hemophagocytic lymphocytosis or macrophage activation syndrome. But as you can see here, so far, no, uh, no HLH. And in fact, uh, she developed thereafter a quite mild HLH with splenomegaly, thrombocytopenia, lofagrinogen, and increased ferritin. And uh, she was completely, completely cured by uh, allo HSCT, and she's now quite well. And so to come back on this rubella vaccine granuloma, which are associated to um, primary immune deficiency, you can see here a picture of the granuloma. You can see in pink CD68 that will stain macrophages here, and in brown the rubella staining. So you can see here a macrophage, which is infected by the rubella vaccine, uh, vaccinal strain. So you can see it can be quite uh, debilitating. Uh, it can be more uh, more light here on this patient. You can see uh, the patient here uh, that I presented uh, before. And it is associated to combined immune deficiency, but also to familial HLS-related disease. 
such as hierogricity syndrome uh, or uh, Shidaki Gashi syndrome, but also to several other primary immune deficiency. So when you suspect primary, primary immune deficiency on granuloma, you should look for a rubella, vac a rubella vaccine. And when you have rubella vaccine, vaccine or strain on granuloma, you should think of primary immune deficiency. New clinical case, this two-year-old girl born for consanguineous parents. Here, first red flag, she had rec recurrent otitis media with low IgG level, isolated mammary B cell lymphopenia. She had max plenomegaly, as you can see here on the CT, and she had also pulmonary nodules with lymphatic distribution and adenopathy. So a picture that is quite reminiscent of sar sarcoidosis, but with, uh, with many uh, uncommon features. And in fact, after genetic testing, this patient, uh, she had a LRBA deficiency, which is um, one cause of the primary immune deficiency associated to immune dysregulation, which can associate lymphoproliferation, uh, inconsistency, inconsistency, autoimmunity, colitis, and susceptibility to infection. So it's important to, uh, to do the diagnosis because uh, first you can uh, start with uh, prophylaxis, IVIG, and you can also give a treatment that is uh, well suited for this disease, which is uh, abatacept. And with that, uh, you can go more easily to, uh, to uh, achieve CTs that uh, she received. And here is a picture to show you uh, these primary immune deficiency, which are associated to immune dysregulation, uh, with, which can lead to autoimmunity, lymphoproliferation, and more or less susceptibility to infections. You have here a classic dendritic cell normal immune reaction, dendritic cell that is stimulated by pathogens. It can stimulate a normal autoreactive cell, because we all have autoreactive cell, but after that, the normal process is that it is it will undergo energy and it, you will avoid autoimmunity. And uh, after that, the dendritic cell will activate and it will also promote T cell stimulation and activation that will proliferate and kill your uh, microorganism. But after that, uh, to avoid a fatal lymphoproliferation, you have also mechanism with some, for instance, steroids that will uh, avoid a fatal lymphoproliferation. And if you have any of this mechanism that uh, is disturbed, uh, it uh, will lead to uh, lymphoproliferation. Here you have T-cell lymphoproliferation. Your auto-reactive T-cell will lead to autoimmunity. It will also stimulate auto-reactive B-cells that will produce um, auto-reactive antibodies. It may stimulate macrophages and it may lead to uh, formation of granuloma. And there are many, many uh, primary immune deficiencies which may be associated to, to this me mechanism. And uh, I uh, highlighted the, uh, the ones that uh, I mentioned, especially NRBA deficiency and CTLA4 deficiencies that will lead to a TREG impairment. And the last uh, clinical case here is a two year old girl born from non consanguineous parents. She had right anybody seizure. The CSF was normal except for oligoclonal synth um, IgG synthesis. Only one of her seizures at 14 years old, but otherwise she had no symptoms except for headaches. And she had repeated uh, uh, brain MRI. And you can see this quite impressive uh, lesion on the white matter that was spontaneously relapsing and remitting, almost asymptomatic. She also had a CT scan with pulmonary nodules and adenopathies, so also reminiscent of uh, sarcoidosis. Corticosteroids were uh, uh, improved the situation a lot. And in left on the lymph node histology, she has granulomatous adenitis, but which was not uh, typical for our pathologies. And on the lung radiology and histology, when we, uh, we, made, we made a review with our radiologist, and expert pathologists. In fact, it was uh, not suggestive at all of sarcoidosis, but rather it, is, it was suggestive of what uh, is called GLID for granulomatous lymphocytic interstitial lung disease, which is strongly also associated to primary immune deficiency. She had also a mild hypo-HGG, and uh, so far we didn't find any mutation in a known primary immune deficiency related genes, but probably we should go. Uh, we should continue the genetic exploration because she clearly has not a classic sarcoidosis. 
So uh, to conclude, uh, I put back the red flags when you should think of uh, primary immune deficiency in front of systemic granulomatous disorders. You can think of it uh, with susceptibility to infection, with infectious granuloma, think of chronic granulomatous septic disease, think of primary immune deficiency with granuloma associated to a typical bacteria. Think also uh, of it in front of uh, non-infectious granuloma, combined immune deficiency, immune dysregulation with GLILD, early onset IBD, think of CGD, um, but there are probably many, many others all to come. And uh, what can be proposed when you have a suspicion of primary immune deficiency is a quite basic immunological assessment. The first thing to do is performing lymphocyte phenotyping. If very importantly, you should include naive and memory T cell for combined immune deficiency, um, dosage of IgG AM, the, the DHR is important to, uh, for CGD. Catherine staining may be uh, performed from, uh, with uh, on cytometry for uh, HLH related to the mutation. Rebella vaccine staining on PCR and biopsy. And biopsy. Uh, you should do an extensive microbiological assessment to exclude an atypical infection. And if you, if you can, you should try to find a pathologist that is an expert in this, in this disease to review the histology. And finally, if you have a strong suspicion, even if all these um, assessments are normal, you should go to genetic analysis because some primary immune deficiency, deficiencies are, have a normal immunological assessment. And finally, why it is important to, to do the diagnosis? Uh, because depending on the disease, you can start infectious prophylaxis, you can start IVIG, you will be able to make the screening for other organ involvements. You can start a specific treatment. I mentioned CTLA, CTLA IG, but also importantly, the only curative treatment for most of these diseases is uh, allohct. And so uh, I I say it again, but it's very important to keep in mind that the morbid mortality of HSCT is strongly correlated to organ damage. So um, early diagnosis is uh, an adaptive treatment before HSCT uh, are very, very important. So I will finish that. I will thank all the clinicians uh, that took care of the patient. Uh, I will uh, thank you for your attention. I think I will take questions um, at the end. Thank you. Thank, yeah, thank you very much, Benjamin, for this uh, fantastic overview. Uh, we move directly to Karin Stoke. So, Professor Karin Wouters, she's a talented pediatric rheumatologist uh, with an expertise in uh, different uh, diseases, including Stills disease, GIA, lupus, genetics. And she spent a lot of time during her career to investigate a specific granulomatous disease, which is the Blow syndrome. And she worked with the association, with uh, Carlos Rosé and uh, all the colleagues to set up a database. And she has a huge experience in this specific disease. So, Karin, I just know you are also very well um, involved in many networks, including the RITA network. And you made fantastic work with the, for the community and for educational purpose. So, thank you, Karin, a lot for all you did. And we are listening to you now. The floor is yours. Thank you, Alexandre. Uh, I hope you hear me. Can you hear me? Do you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Alexandre, for this introduction that is much too kind. And indeed, it's now my pleasure to tell you something more about Blau syndrome that can be uh, considered an autoinflammatory condition, but more particularly, may be considered la prima donna among the uh, granulomatous inflammatory diseases. And I will tell you why. I will present you uh, our data on the clinical course and the clinical phenotype gathered thanks to an international registry and a prospective cohort. And I will share what we are learning on the pathomechanism of Blau syndrome. So this child presented at a dermatologist in Paris with a monomorphic micropapular eruption that had erupted a few weeks before, uh, after the BCG vaccine. And um, her father had, her father had an acquired camptodactyly, suffered a chronic arthropathy and had visual loss. And in view of the combination, the dermatologist made the diagnosis of Blau syndrome. And indeed, a very 
particular inflammatory disease presenting at an early age characterized by a triad of skin, joint and eye inflammation was described in 1985 by Blau in 11 members of a four-generation family, clearly showing an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. The genetic cause of Blau was, was um, the genetic cause of Blau was defined in 2001 by Corinne Misseli, who identified missense mutations in exon 4 of the NOT2 gene, coding the NACH domain of the NOT2 protein. The presence of non-caseating giant cell granulomas are the pathological hallmark, the core feature, and one of the most fascinating aspects of Blau syndrome. Blau syndrome, which is characterized by a triad of granulomatous dermatitis, boggy polyarthritis, and both anterior and posterior uveitis, and that can occur both in a familial and a sporadic form. The latter was previously also called early onset sarcoidosis. The skin rash is the first symptom to appear, usually in the first year of life. You see this reddish-brown micropapular eruption, which often wins with time. Arthritis is the most predominant manifestation, starting in the first decade. It is polyarticular, symmetrical, affecting both large and small peripheral joints with an exuberant synovial and tenosynovial swelling, and often a preserved range of motion. With time, however, and after, after many years only, limitation and uh, deformities, you see the camptodactyly here, but also some knee and ankle deformities will appear, and they cause moderate to severe functional impairment in one third of patients in our cohorts. An unexpected and very interesting finding on the X-rays of Blau Hans was the total absence of erosive and destructive changes and the presence of some dysplasia-like features shown here, a big concave radial epiphysis, a distal ulnar shortening, dysplasia and rotation of the lunate and scaphoid bo bones, and camptodactyly due to PIP joint space narrowing and contracture. Uveitis in Blau is a major concern. It was observed in three quarters of patients, bilateral in almost all, and with panuveitis in more than 50%. Anterior uveitis has some typical features, such as actus nodules and focal senechiae. Posterior involvement, as shown here, includes multifocal choroiditis, vitritis with snowballs on fundus photography, retinal vasculitis with some peripheral leakage, and optic disc edema. Despite all patients receiving uh, prolonged topical and systemic, often triple therapy, we noticed a persistent inflammatory activity during the follow-up. There was a high prevalence of both anterior and posterior uveitis complications, including synechiae, cataract, glaucoma, and chorioretinal scars, as shown on this image. This all together led to moderate visual impairment in one-third and blindness in 15% with a further progressive loss of visual acuity during the disease course. It has become clear that Blau is in fact a systemic illness that can affect a variety of organs outside the clinical tri triad, as shown on this pie chart, which represents cumulative clinical manifestations in a large number of patients from the international cohort. And these images show granulomas on a liver biopsy, and here on a kidney biopsy, and here a CT angio image revealing a Takayasu-like arthritis in a blau patient who presented suddenly with hypertension and decreased carotid pulsations. In the prospective cohort, we noted a myriad of extratriate symptoms that occurred in almost half of the blau patients, including prolonged fever, liver, spleen, lymph node enlargement, severe arterial and sometimes pulmonary hypertension, nephritis, interstitial pneumonitis, CNS involvement with uh, diffuse granulomatous encephalitis and meningitis, large vessel and small vessel vasculitis. And the fact that uh, early onset is not a benign disease, so that the potential severity of this condition was already highlighted already in the 1990s in six children who showed severe complications uh, such as blindness, but also severe visceral involvement, severe arterial hypertension, and uh, one case with a multi-organ fatal uh, granulomatous inflammation. 
However, three, three decades later, and despite uh, advanced therapeutic possibilities, the morbidity related to blau extratriate manifestations is still too high, as shown in some recent observations. A Turkish boy here who suffered an encephalopathy after a prolonged disease course, an Indian woman who had pro who developed both hepatitis with portal hypertension and nephritis over the course of 20 years, infantile onset in a baby with a novel NOT2 mutation in the central NAC domain and granulomatous hepatitis resulting in cirrhosis and necessitating liver transplantation in an adult who had been followed since the age of three with uveitis and polyarthritis. Moving to NOT2, the NOT2 gene encodes a protein with a tripartite structure shown here with two N-terminal CART effector domains, a central NOT domain with four subdomains for nucleotide binding at the ATP hydrolysis, and a C-terminal sensor domain with several LRRs. An increasing number of mutations have been described and are find, are, can be found in the InFevers registry. Most blau NOT2 mutations have arginine at position 334, Almost all mutations are within or near the Nacht, central Nacht or not domain. They have a high penetrance. They can be associated with a, with a complete phenotype, but also with incomplete forms, as well as with expanded involvement. Conversely, distinct not two variants, mostly located in the LRR domain, are associated with an increased susceptibility for Crohn's and considered the main driver of early onset IBD. Looking at the genetic and phenotypic spectrum as we know it now, indeed incomplete forms of blau do exist. And E608 was the first not two mutation that we found in a family with seven members with isolated granulomatous uveitis. We found incomplete penetrance of blau not two mutations. For example, in this family who had two affected members and four unaffected carriers in gray. Somatic NOT2 mosaicism and even gonosomal uh, NOT2 mutations were found in patients with a typical blau phenotype. They were demonstrated by Juan Orastegui using targeted deep NOT2 sequencing. And at last, more recently, a combination of likely pathogenic variants of NOT2 and other AID genes were reported in patients with an adult onset mixed autoinflammatory phenotype. This cartoon shows the canonical NOT2 signaling pathway. And as mentioned, NOT2 is an innate immune uh, protein expressing innate immune cells, and it serves as an intracellular sensor through its LRR domain for MDP, muramyl dipeptide, which is a bacterial peptidoglycan motif. Upon recognition of MDP, NOT2 unfold, oligomerize through the NAC domain and recruit RIP2 kinase uh, via CART CART interaction. Activated trip 2 kinase will recruit TAC1 complex, which leads to NF-kappa B and MAP kinase activation, and finally to the production of inflammatory cytokines, hemokines, and caspases. Not to signaling and regulation, however, is much more complex, as briefly mentioned here. So, in addition to the canonical pathway, which I just mentioned, not to also can induce mitochondrial antiviral responses through activation of IRF3 and type 1 interfering responses. It plays a role in the autophagy machinery through the recruitment of autophagy proteins. And also, a large number of proteins are known to bind and interact with NOT2 and thereby influence the final outcome of NOT2 protein triggering. Um, RIP2 is the best known interaction partners. Other proteins mentioned on this cartoon will interfere with NOT2 functions in autophagy, in caspase one dependent IL-1 beta secretion, and even with the promotion of Th1 and Th17 responses. Moving to NOT2 in blau then, this figure shows the uh, NOT2, uh, the crystal structure actually of NOT2 and its subdomains. And so an inactive closed state of NOT2 is maintained by ADP binding and several interdomain interactions. Blau mutations that are indicated by the coral spheres uh, are located in the NOT subdomain interfaces, thereby likely to disrupt the inner domain interactions and facilitate a conformational change to the active open form, which is needed for oligomerization and downstream pathway activation. 
And indeed, uh, based on studies on in transfected cells, Shamayar has shown that constitutive activation occurs with NOT2 variants associated with blau. Conversely, NOT2 variants in the LRR domain associated with Crohn's failed to spontaneously, to spontaneously uh, trigger the NF-kappa-B pathway. Two recent studies have shown a prominent role for interferon gamma in the pathophysiology of blau. Using macrophages differentiated from blau, patient, from blau uh, monocytes and generated from blau-specific induced pluripotent stem, stem cells, the authors showed that interferon gamma acts as a priming signal through the upregulation of the NOT2 expression, which will induce a spontaneously increased NF-kappa-B activity without MDP stimulation. Interferon gamma stimulation of brown macrophages resulted in an enhanced transcriptional inflammatory signature, as seen here in red, and an increased inflammatory cytokine production without MDP, again to see, uh, seen here in red. Conversely, macrophages from blau patients that were treated with anti-TNF failed to produce an inflammatory transcription say, signal as well at the cytokine level. And this led the authors to postulate that prolonged anti-TNF treatment may block an auto-inflammatory loop, thereby providing a rationale for TNF targeting therapies in blau. Since the pathogenesis of blau is played out in tissue where inflammation occurs, we performed morphology and immunohistochemistry studies on biopsies of patients. And as illustrated here, blau granulomas are exuberant, forming large complexes and exhibiting prominent lymphocytic coronas with rim of fibroblasts around the core of macrophages, epithelioid cells, and multinucleated giant cells. Using immunohistochemistry, Activated macrophages, CD68, and uh, CD4 T cells emerged as the key players. And as seen on these stainings, blau granulomas display an abundant and widespread inflammatory cytokine expression in situ, almost a macrophage activation in situ, if you wish, with a high expression of interferon gamma IL-6 and IL-17 and a moderate expression of TGF-beta and IL-23. Conversely and intriguingly, blau patients do not typically uh, show increased circulating levels of acute phase reactants. We then performed plasma protein profiling using Luminex technology and found that there are several proteins that are clearly more abundant in blau plasma versus healthy, especially IL-8, IL-16 and S100A12, with the highest increase found for S100A12. We moved to the S100 proteins and found that S100A12, 8 and 9 plasma levels are significantly elevated in blau, patient, blau patients. And interestingly, the levels in the joint fluid were strongly increased compared to plasma levels. At last, S100 plasma levels correlate with the active joint count, which makes us think that circulating S100 levels reflect a release of these proteins from the granulomas in the inflamed synovium, and that they might be maybe uh, a potential biomarker for arthritis in blau. At last, I wish to say a few words on the giant cells that remain a, few, they're a very curious phenomenon uh, in blau uh, granulomas, and their role as of today is still a no, known. We know that multinucleated giant cells arise or originate from macrophage fusion and can be uh, classified in Langhans giant cells, as seen in blau, for embodied giant cells and osteoclasts, depending on their anatomical site, their morphology and function. So we have generated three different types of giant cells from PBMC-derived monocytes using MCSF with interferon gamma for Langhans giant cells, IL-4 for foreign body cells and rank ligand for osteoclasts respectively. And here light microscopy shows the typical morphological features of the Langhans giant cells with a ring of nuclei along the cellular border. Whereas in the other types, the nuclei are scattered throughout the cytoplasm. With image stream, you can see the sorted mononuclear and multinucleated populations for each cell type. 
and we then performed comparative transcriptomics in both the monocytes and the multinucleated cell types. And so that multinucleation causes a downregulation of the core macrophage gene signature, the genes related to pathogen rec recognition of antigen presentation and tissue residency in all three subtypes. Conversely, there was an upregulation of genes associated with iron uh, homeostasis, iron pools, that are needed to sustain the mitochondrial metabolism for increased energy demands. At last, um, we saw that multinucleation is associated with cell specialization specific to each polycarion. And so, Langhans giant cells inter induced by interferon gamma showed a transcriptional profile enriched for antigen presentation and adaptive immune, immune pathway. And then when we stimulated total BBMCs instead of monocytes with interferon gamma, we could generate granuloma-like clusters only with interferon gamma, not with the others. And these contained LGCs and TD3 T cells in close proximity. And in, of interest, LGCs showed increased expression of surface markers such as B7H3 that are essential for a crosstalk with T cells. So altogether, I think these data confirm an important role for both interferon gamma and for the NF-kappa B related cytokines in the pathogenesis of granulomatous inflammation in blau. So to end, a better knowledge of the clinical features and the disease course and some advancing insights into the complex biological background of this condition has led us, together with an international consortium, to propose some points to consider for a better care and a better, better therapeutic approach for these patients. And I just wish to share a few statements that, statements that we agreed upon. So first, the clinical phenotype of Blau associates a variable combination of systemic, joint, eye, and other organ inflammation. Blau uveitis is associated with progressive visual morbidity despite, despite the current therapies, and extra manifestations are frequent and can have severe complications, necessitating a systematic follow-up of blood pressure, peripheral pulses, and uh, the liver kidney function, and the totality of the patient. Uh, most patients uh, with Blau receive today long-term combined low-dose systemic steroids together with immunomodulatory and biological drugs. And as we saw, there is a clear rationale for TNF targeting. And indeed, anti-TNF monoclonal antibodies are the prevailing option for chronic arthritis and visceral manifestations and do well in most patients. Higher anti-TNF dosages and prolonged association with steroids are often needed for patients with uveitis. However, we do see patients refractory to the combination of MTX and anti-TNF therapy, and in these patients, alternative biological therapies in antagonizing IL-1 and IL-6 and JAK inhibitors are being considered nowadays. And at last, we, do, uh, we are convinced, we do feel that research collaboration towards a better comprehensive understanding of the Blau pathophysiology is essential and is highly needed to develop effective targeted therapies and improve the ocular and overall outcome for these patients. And I wish, just wish to show you the incredible uh, international collaborative network that we uh, work together and that allows us to advance in this, uh, in this condition. And first of all, I went, wish to mention Carlos Rose, who is the co-founder of this project and re remains the best companion several geneticists, pathologists, biologists who have helped us to advance to gain insights and then particularly the uh, physicians and patients from all over the planet who shared their experience and their data and at last uh, very specially uh, Troy Townsend, Felix uh, and the, all the members of the Blau Foundation who we consider uh, as magnificent partners in all projects on research and for care uh, of Blau syndrome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Karin, for this uh, fantastic talk. Um, I have lost my camera, so I hope you can still hear me. Um, in any case, I'd like to give the voice now to the patient association and Troy Tosin 
and uh, his child, uh, Felix. So Troy is the founder of Cure Blue Syndrome. And uh, I think it's in the spirit of Rita's webinar to give the voice to, to the patients. And we are really, really delighted to welcome you on stage, especially because I think it's two or three the morning uh, right now in, the, in North America. So thank you very much for joining at this uh, time. And we are listening to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. I'm going to actually, you hear me? I'm going to hand over to Felix Townsend, who's a patient advocate for Blau syndrome, um, to jump in because I know we're running short on time. Here you go, Felix. Um, I just want to say good morning. Um, I, well, afternoon for you. Sorry, it's, <laughs> it's weird time zones. Uh, so, yeah, it's three in the morning where I am. So, uh, it's, let's, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> So you may be wondering why a 14 year old is here speaking with you today. I am a rare disease advocate and I learned from an even younger advocate, my sister Lexi, who lost her life at just six years old to Blau syndrome. From a young age, I became aware of my sister's struggle. It was, it was not just with her disease, but with the world's unfamiliarity with such a rare condition. Lexi was almost three when I was almost three when Lexi was born, and I quickly learned to be extra careful with her because she was often in pain. I wanted to, always wanted to make Lexi better and would often think up ways to stop her pain. I would pretend to be her doctor and would give her imaginary medicine and tell her that she was cured. Eventually, I realized that a make-believe cure wouldn't help her, and that lay, led me to fundraising. I was five when I started writing a book to raise funds for research. At the time, Lexi was diagnosed with juvenile arthritis. My book was published just before my sixth birthday. Around the time, Lexi finally received the results of her genetic testing, which confirmed she had blast syndrome. We thought juvenile arthritis was rare, but that was nothing compared to Blau. By then, Lexi had been in and out of the hospital, trying multiple different biologics that all failed her. It was challenging to convince her medical team of how severe her symptoms really were. They based all of their decisions on brief moments, which didn't reflect her daily reality. Lexi lived with pain most of her life, but learned to compartmentalize and could do almost anything. Think about yourself. Have you ever had a terrible flu? Maybe it lasted a week, but during that time, you probably had to push through some commitments, a job interview, an assignment, or even just a chore. And maybe if a family friend or a, member, a family member dropped by, you tried to put on a positive face. But was this really how you felt? Probably not. Now, Imagine feeling that way every day of the year. You gather all your strength to do what you need to and maybe a few things that make you happy. But afterwards, you suffer for it. You feel even worse. But that's the trade-off for some quality of life. That was Lexi. At her appointments or during school visits, Lexi would push through her pain and make things happen. She'd run, she'd go to dance class, she'd feed herself, and she'd do all sorts of things. But was it sustainable? Absolutely not. Did she suffer for it? Definitely. I often had to help feed Lexi because her hands and wrists were too sore. And sometimes I had to carry her because her knees, ankles, and toes were too inflamed. But did she show that at her appointments? Never. She'd be vulnerable with her family, but she wanted to show her independence to the rest of the world. This made it so difficult for us to get her the support she truly needed, because technically she could do it. She just couldn't sustain it. Of all the specialists Lexi saw, over 10 at the time, only one had ever heard of Blau. Our family doctor even asked my mom what the prognosis was for Blau syndrome. That's when we knew we couldn't just rely on Lexi's medical team to get her the help she needed. 
we decided as a family to start the Cure Black Foundation to raise awareness, to create a community of patients and scientists, and to raise funds for medical research. Lexi started a social media account called Black, Me, My Dad, and Black, sharing her journey and raising awareness. We were starting to make so much progress, but then she got very sick very fast. Lexi often had flares that landed her in the ER, each visit repeating the same story. Doctors would think she had a terrible virus or infection, but my parents knew it was an inflammatory response. A complication of blast syndrome. They would run tests, an MRI, a spinal tap, and, and finally my parents would convince them to try a high dose of steroids and she would bounce back. This happened all the time. My parents were always worried about MAS, but doctors told them it wasn't a documented concern for blast syndrome. Well, the last time it happens, two things went wrong. They missed the signs of MAS and gave her the wrong dose of steroids. The doctor felt terrible, but the biggest mistake was not having a critical health, a critical care plan in place so the ER team would know what to do in case of an emergency. Instead, they were trying to figure out a plan in an emergency situation. And that is never the right time to be thinking of a plan. On October 19th, 2019, Lexi lost her life to MIS, confirmed by autopsy. When Lexi died, I told my parents, we need to find a cure for blast syndrome. I didn't want anyone else to find, feel the pain that I was going through. Lexi died just before her seventh birthday. I made a film to help her wish for a cure come true. And I posted it on Me, My Dad, and Blau. Within hours, it had spread worldwide. Through that film, we connected with more patients and Blau actually made it on billboards around the US. I could hardly imagine this ultra rare disorder featured on billboards. I have been able to raise $75,000 to fund our annual Lexi's Legacy Research Grants. Our advocacy work has taught us a crucial lesson. Engaging the public's interest in rare diseases requires creativity. My latest campaign, A Million Acts of Love, I hope to inspire people to do a million acts of love, good deeds, in Lexi's, oh, by Lexi's 12th birthday on December 16th. I've been in the news almost every day in the past weeks talking about campaigns. These, and each time we do these, we raise awareness for auto-inflammatory diseases. You can also help me. You can help me. If you want to sign up, the details are on the slide. Sign up on our website and then go out and spread kindness. No act is too small and the possibilities are endless. I understand that many of you do volunteer work already and you can apply towards this goal if you sign up. If, you, um, I, if I meet my goal, I know I will raise more awareness for rarities and just as importantly, find more patients. Lexi has taught me that age is no barrier to making a significant impact. The pain of losing Lexi never goes away, but it comforts me to know that she continues to make a significant impact on the world. I hope that everyone listening feels inspired in some way to help better patient outcomes. Thank you to everyone for listening and thank you to all the doctors who are working tirelessly to advance research for auto-inflammatory patients. Hi guys, I'm, I'm Troy Townsend, I'm Lexi's dad, I'm the co-founder of Cure Blau Foundation. Uh, Lexi, of course, was the catalyst. Um, our goal as a foundation is to improve outcomes for all Blau syndrome patients. Um, I, we just have seven ways, I, wanna, I know we're running short on time, I'm going to jump through uh, the seven ways that patient organizations and doctors to work together to, to get better outcomes. The first is early diagnosis. Uh, Lexi's diagnosis took way too long, over three years, and many patients takes even long. And as an organization, we've just launched the first patient-entered registry with Sanford Health. Uh, it's a global registry. 
um, that we'll be looking at the the full effects of blouse syndrome because with the triad, the, the uveitis, the skin, and the arthritis, uh, there's a lot more to blouse than just that, and uh, this will be a good recording of that. The next way that we work together is biobanks, very critical for rare disease. We've got a partnership now with the NIGMS and the Coriel Institute. We're accepting samples worldwide and doctors can facilitate those samples. Uh, the collection of them, it's free from anywhere in the world for patients to donate. Um, and we're really encouraging patients to do that. But the facilitation of the collection of those samples can be done just during your regular blood work and rheumatologists can certainly help with that. Uh, policies and frameworks very important, as Corinne had just mentioned. Um, we've come up with some great clinical guidelines. We would also love to get specialized care plans, not just for bowel patients, but for all rare disease patients. So when they do show up in the ER like Lexi, they can get that treatment that they need. Clinical trials, of course, very important. A well-informed patient community can really drive uh, patients to those clinical trials. And that's something that as a foundation, we're, we're very passionate about research. Um, the patient voice should always be guiding research and we've been funding projects um, to make sure that the research aligns with what patients are looking for. And of course, the most in, well, one of the most important is funding. All this happens with funding and uh, we've raised over $200,000 as a very small patient organization for Blau syndrome. We're supporting projects in the US, in Japan, and, it, and we actually have a, a new Lexi's Legacy Research Grant coming up soon. Uh, all the information is available on QRBS website, our www.qrbs.com. So yeah, you can find out more about all of these things. And uh, if you want to help Felix with his campaign, that's a millionactsoflove.com. Thanks everybody. Wow, what blah. Thank you very much, uh, Troy and Felix for this emotional testimony, very useful. And um, we measure how numerous are the unmet needs in the management of blow syndrome and in rare disease in general. And uh, we will definitely advertise your foundation. And I think the, the website of the RITA network can have a place for the uh, foundation somewhere. And we can diffuse also information. And on the other side, it's also a way to uh, solicitate research in the field of blow syndrome thanks to the funding you you you, may, you get and you manage to raise so we will uh, be partners of this and uh, thank you again for your for your uh, fantastic uh, and emotion talk uh, i think we can have a few minutes for question to um the speakers I don't see any coming up in the chat or in the q and I, I may start to, to the colleagues. Okay, no, I have. We have one question. So, Karin, what, biologically speaking, is the purpose of granuloma formation in the context of blow? So okay. I just, yeah. Let's I go. think it, that's a wonderful, I think, a $1 million question. Uh, yes. The fact is, we do not know what is the, the reason of this, the existence of these reasons, because indeed granulomas normally are meant to be an immune inflammatory response against an antigen, like a mycobacterial antigen or a foreign body. And in Blau, we have no reason. So we really do not know <laughs> what the purpose is in this context. It's more like an aberrant, non-needed, non exaggerated immune inflammatory response that we see in, in other auto-inflammatory diseases, I'm afraid. Um, there has been research on looking for uh, compounds or components of pathogens, viral, mi microbial and fungal, in blau granulomas, and nothing has been consistently shown. Uh, there has been maybe a few findings of BCG-related um, uh, particles in, in blau granulomas, but this has not been confirmed. Now, maybe with the new uh, technologies and with, with what uh, Benjamin has been showing on uh, rubella uh, vaccine, it, it could be interesting to look for, um, with novel, novel technologies, to look for some infectious uh, triggers uh, in this condition. But anyway, it is then an inappropriate and exaggerated uh, response to any trigger. 
Thank you. For, following this comment, a question for, for both of you, um, Benjamin and Karine. Regarding the, the possible putative pathogen, do you think that there is a place for a next gene seek for microbes within the granuloma to catch what is uh, going on inside? You mentioned rubella should, should be done. And if uh, it's positive, we will think about immunodeficiencies. But is there another larger strategy to screen for any pathogen now that will arrive and help us to identify a specific uh, antigen? Um, I, maybe I can sort of the uh, routine, the, the clinical point of view. In this uh, disease, when we have here, uh, at least when we have these uh, systemic granulomatous disorders with many red flags and we don't have the genetic test, for instance, for the last patient I mentioned, we uh, indeed we perform metagenomic on the on the histology if we can do it. We do uh, next generation sequencing for um, to find any pathogen that uh, can be can be retrieved and. Um, Often we don't find uh, we don't find uh, any pathogen. You should be aware that metagenomic is not uh, perfect for uh, it may miss some pathogen depending on your pipeline. For, in, for instance, I, I know here that in, in Mecca, the one in Paris, it's not very good at finding fungi or, or mycobacteria because of the wall of the microorganisms. So you should you should uh, have that in mind and talk to your biologist to perform over. Mm -hmm. um, Microbiology, microbiological test. But um, indeed, so far, we did not find uh, any other uh, any other microorganism. For instance, uh, with the rubella vaccine, we didn't find measles uh, in the um, uh, in the granuloma. But I think it's probably important to do also because if you have a primary immune deficiency, uh, you don't want to miss an infection that should be treated. And so uh, I think uh, with a decrease of cost, it will be important to do. Maybe one thing to, to add still is that in, in blau granulomas, the structure of the granuloma is a little bit different from the one we find in the immune deficiency related granulomas. It's much more structured. It's, uh, it's composed mostly of T4 cells and not a mixture of T4 and T8 cells. Um, well, towards the clinician, that points towards a sterile granuloma, I, I wish to say. Yeah? So the well-organized structure and the presence of uh, T4 cells rather than T8 cells does not suggest that there could be an infectious cause. But yeah, time will tell and more advanced techniques may uh, unveil some interesting unexpected findings. Okay, fantastic. I think we are already six minutes after the schedule. So I will again thank you all for this amazing uh, and fantastic talks around granuloma, which is still of interest. There is a lot to do especially in the perspective of patients. And we learn a lot thanks to, to the testimony of Felix and Troy. So thank you all for coming. So I ask you to join the next meeting, early December, the first Tuesday. It will be dedicated to Wilscott Aldrich syndrome. So uh, don't hesitate to join and uh, have a good day. Keep your night for the colleagues in North America. And see you. Thank you very much. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye, thank you.